great work of our times, I would say, is moving the human community from its present situation as a destructive presence on the planet to a benign or mutually enhancing presence. It's that simple. Our entire approach to learning and our entire approach to the profession needs to be changed because we begin with our human need, like our constitution is we the people. Now, uh, we leave out the rights of everything else on the planet because we're primarily relating to the human. The medicine tends to begin with the human. It can't begin with the human. It has to begin with the idea that the human is health is a subsystem of the earth health. You cannot have well humans on a sick planet. You cannot have a viable uh, human economy by destroying the earth economy. In other words, uh, we need to move the basic reference from the human uh, to this larger uh, context of things. I was about 11 years old, I and the family moved to a certain area, and I, uh, before the house was finished, uh, it was out on the border of things, and I went one morning in May down across the creek, and there was a meadow there of lilies, white lilies. The grass was eight, ten inches high, but this, the lilies grew just above them. And that became normative for me. All my life, that has been my referent. In other words, a good politics would uh, preserve that meadow, a good legal system, a good, uh, a good religion would teach me the deeper meaning of that. Uh, good economics would learn how to so cultivate land that the meadow uh, would be preserved. So it, it became, in a sense, normative for my response to the various events of life. I was born in 1914, and I lived as a child uh, in a world that was just beginning to be mechanized, the roads being paved, the first automobiles were coming into existence. Uh, the radio was not invented when I was young. A, a, a significant motion picture hadn't been made. All these things came uh, during my lifetime, so I've lived in the 20th century. But the sensitivity I had as a child when they're paving a ro the roads. I couldn't go barefoot anymore. It was so comfortably as on dirt roads. And the streams that I waded in and had early experiences by, and I lived in a family where uh, children could go out and wander. So I had that kind of experience, and I had the, a foreboding from the time I was rather young of a commercial world. And it stayed with me, I suppose, all my life. But when I was 20, I needed to understand what was happening. And so I went to the monastery to, uh, to brood. <laughs> I always thought you, to brood, you either had to go to jail or go to a monastery. So I said, well, maybe I'll go to a monastery. So, my life, I was a brooding person. I'm not an unhappy person, not an unhappy child, but brooding, trying to figure what's happening. <laughs> so, I come to this later years of life uh, with a sense of 
some vague insight into what has been happening in this 20th century. We originally were intent on taking control of the planet for our use and of making human use of things the norm of our relationship with things. In other words, our primary relationship with the natural world for the last century has been use. And that, to my mind, is just disastrous because one of the things that among humans, one of the worst things that can be said is, you used me to the, the devastation of the other things uh, we have. Now, the natural world tells us, I will feed you, I will clothe you, I will shelter you, I will heal you. But don't use me in a destructive way because I have uh, primary benefits of the wonder and beauty and imagination. I have interior riches to bestow upon you and even a sense of the divine. But I can no longer do this. If you're going to degrade me, and you're going to uh, uh, distort my, our relationship. So uh, it's a question of the demonic aspect of use over the deeper relationship that we bear to things as regards the specific issue of humans on the planet Earth and the Cenozoic period, the human came into being in a context as a unit. You cannot deal with the, if you damage part of it, you damage the whole thing. It needs to function in an integral way. And so uh, that's what's important because if we so damage the outer world and so cloud the atmosphere that children cannot see the stars, they cannot have the experience they should be having of birds and meadows and of streams and such things, then they, they will still have the need for that, but they'll never be able to satisfy it. So we will be making I ruin a situation and a painful situation for future generations. This historical moment is so critical is because the very structure and functioning of the planet Earth are endangered. The extinction is taking place in living beings, the trees, the plants, and the animals, they're all uh, in severe danger at the present time because we have the rivers are toxic, the air has become uh, poisonous, and the very conditions of life on the planet are altered in a deleterious way. Moments of grace are transformation moments when the destiny of the universe and the destiny of any part of the universe is determined for its future possibilities. So I say we have religious moments of grace, historical moments of grace, cosmological moments of grace. But these are all, in my terms, special sacred moments. And at the present time particularly, this is a determining moment it's a very special, sacred moment, as well as a moment of, uh, of uh, political moment or uh, educational moment or whatever. But primarily, it's, a, well, it's into the realm of what I call the sacred. Our ideal is to develop a mutually enhancing relationship and in our technologies, what we should be working for is human technologies that are integral with the technologies of the planet. The planet itself is a wonderful technological accomplishment, 
the drawing up uh, of the water from the oceans, uh, taking it over the continents, spilling it down to nourish the plants and the forest, and then draining it back to the sea is an amazing engineering accomplishment. But in the process, it a, has this magnificence, a stunning beauty and wonder about it. Humans need to become integral with that technology. As human beings, our great need is to become integral with the community that brings us into existence, that uh, provides us with the nourishment that we need physically and psychically, and enables us to experience that high delight in existence for which all things are made. Story is important for any people at any time. All peoples have a story to know how things came to be in the beginning, how they came to be as they are. In Western, the Western world, our basic story is the biblical story of creation by a transcendent personal deity that took place some 5,000 years ago. Now, with our contemporary science, we have discovered that the universe is something like 14 billion years old. It was self-emergent, and it has come to be what it is through a sequence of tra irreversible transformation episodes. And this new universe has uh, scientific precision, but no numinous meaning. The story, the story that the Bible gave us and that we've lived by in uh, our past, the past of Western civilization has had numinous meaning, but not scientific um, accuracy. We need a new story that will integrate these, make these stories uh, inherently compatible with each other, so that we have a single story that embraces both our modern story of the universe, the scientific story of the universe, but we need the numinous meaning that we discover in our earlier story. We will be alienated from the universe until we have a story, an adequate story of the universe that tells the story of the human as well as the story of everything else because it's part of one single process that's been going through a sequence of transformative episodes. Now, uh, to understand this is, as story is very important because scientists, although they have discovered an immense amount of information about the universe, have not told the story of the universe as story. When Brian Swim and I wrote the universe story, as far as I know, it could have been the first time or one of the first times that the information that science has developed was made into, was told as story. 
In fact, uh, a cultural historian from England came to see me, and he said, doesn't it seem like arrogance to write the story of the universe with no footnotes, no quotations, no illustrations, and all that? Well, I said, don't take it too serious as a story, you know, take it or leave it. But I said, Homer didn't put any footnotes in either. So you don't put footnotes in when you're telling a story. As a scientist, write about the universe, but they never tell the story of the universe. But they're just beginning to do it. They held the Epic of Evolution conference in Chicago uh, some years ago, a couple of years ago, and it was the first time that I know of that the scientists had begun realizing that what they have invented and what they've discovered is a story. It's a new story. It's a powerful story. And it's the dynamizing context of understanding at the present time. We need a myth uh, because that's the way in which humans function under some controlling story or idea of the universe. And we generally express that in what is called myth. A myth is not just something uh, fanciful or something uh, unreal. Myth is our approach to the deepest realities of the universe because they're transrational. They're not things that you can put in so many reasonable, deductive uh, formula. It's, it's too, uh, too overwhelming and too, too vast. So uh, we are presently under a myth of that, uh, that supports a destructive uh, a technological process, and which is devastating human relations with the planet. Now, to get out of that, we are ne in need of a, a myth, a mythic approach, and a story, or a vision of, of a world that is more integral with itself, a world of that I describe of wonder and beauty and intimacy. The children enjoy. Uh, children uh, live in a world of, of natural processes. They are happiest there. Uh, you can't talk to children uh, or you can't get them interested in things except rabbits and squirrels and trees and flowers and mountains and all these various phenomena that are given in what we call the natural world. And that's where their imagination expands. But we have been taking them away from that and putting them in uh, a context where they don't know anything other than the machines. They don't know anything other to do with their life than to become a part of a corporation that is dedicated to exploitation. So we, get, uh, we end up by an educational system from kindergarten to through the university and professional school that's uh, preparing them for this type of an exploitation process. The forces needed to change our present situation in relationship to the planet already exist. They've been developed mainly in the last half century, uh, since the time particularly of Rachel Carson. Uh, we only became aware of this, and the difficulty only became so devastating uh, in the first part of the 20th century. And uh, since the time of Rachel Carson, we have become aware of what's happening. But ever since then, um, uh, powers have been uh, put into motion to remedy it. The, um, all the great ecology 
organizations have been established. Uh, some go back to 1892, such as the Sierra Club and the Audubon people go back that far. But they, even then, um, even then they saw the difficulty that was being created uh, by the events at the end of the century. There are four establishments that control our lives. The political legal establishment, that is the government, the economic establishment, the corporation, the intellectual establishment, the university, the religious establishment, the churches, synagogues, or whatever. So all four of these are failing at the present time, in my estimation, because they put a discontinuity between the non-human world and the human world and give all the rights and all the inner values to the human world, no inherent rights or values in the non-human world. Now, uh, each of these, uh, any one of these, could be chosen as a basic uh, point of entry, so to speak. We need work done in all four of these areas. At the moment, the establishment that I think is most important is a legal political establishment because that is the establishment that is controlling our society at the present time. The, we don't have a legal a status for the non-human world, and so the non-human world is being left at the mercy of the human world. And I'm amazed that in jurisprudence that more study is not being done of this issue. And right now, of course, the Constitution is the biggest single obstacle to the environmental movement, and precisely for, for this reason. So what I would like to see is much more a study done of the basis, the basic foundation law of uh, this country. And if we had a basic study done that would uh, get beyond this question that you write a constitution for humans and, uh, and clarify the idea that we need a constitution for the continent that is totally inadequate to write a constitution by humans because humans don't exist as a separate entity. You only have the community of the continent and eventually the, human, the community of the planet Earth. And the humans are a component of this larger community. So that uh, any a truly functional uh, legal establishment would see that the rights of the, uh, each, each component of the community and each component of the community, I believe we have addressed as the rights to be, the rights to habitat, and the rights to fulfill its law, its role in the ever, the ever uh, continuing community of existence. But the legal profession is certainly such that very little can be done eventually if that is not changed. Let me say this. I think when you come to difficult decisions in human life on a large scale, large social scale, I think there are only two forces that are kind of ultimate forces. The one is terror, as what's going to happen if you continue this activity, and the other attraction for the good things that can happen if you do respond to it. So that we're faced now with that decision. And that's why the people that write the stark reality of what we're up against are sometimes just uh, uh, set aside as being apocalyptic, they can't see 
the benefits that we're getting. They can't see how we're surviving. In fact, at the present time, almost all businesses are claiming to be environmentally sensitive. It's become something that nobody in business, in government, or whatever, or, or not nobody perhaps, but few are willing to challenge the fact that we're into a tight situation and that we're going to have to behave differently in all aspects of what we're doing. The universe is out there to be uh, delighted in, to be uh, a source of uh, excitement, of, um, of play, of dancing, or whatever. Now, the iconoclasm that wants us to believe in a universe that's so cruel and so devastating that we have to uh, seize control of it with all our technologies and all our uh, uh, destructive machines and paving roads and all that, uh, well, uh, that's the tension. And that's something that, that we need to resolve before very long. And this idea that a, a brighter vision of things is necessarily unreal and the darker vision is necessarily real is, um, is uh, hardly uh, an, an acceptable view in my terms. <laughs>